countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, one, fire. Lords and ladies, geeks, geekerellas, geekulas, and geekeritas, I am Lord Bloodraw, and this is a very special episode of Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rack and Theater. This episode is being filmed in June of 2021. I mention the date because this year marks the 90th anniversary of two classic films that changed American horror cinema. Ninety years ago, in February of 1931, Universal Studios released Dracula, starring the incomparable Bela Lugosi. And in December came the great Christmas present to horror fans worldwide, Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff the Uncanny. <laughs> These films launched the Universal Studios monster cycle and created the iconic images that still stay with us to this day. Years after, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Wolf Man, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon would all be produced on the strength and huge popularity of these two films. The film we are presenting tonight is a love letter to the classic Universal Monsters, written by and starring Paul Nashi, Spain's foremost horror star best remembered for his character Valdemar Daninsky, The Cursed Werewolf, which he played in several films. <laughs> Tonight, from 1970, it's the weird European monster rally, Assignment Terror. <laughs> and tonight we have a very special guest who will talk to us about the impact of the Universal Monsters and the history of horror cinema. Author, filmmaker, and monster expert, David J. Skull. <laughs> well, without further ado, I give to you this bubbling stew of monsters, mayhem, and aliens, Assignment Terror. Umo 206 calling Earth. Reply, please. Contact made. Kirian Berner, surgeon, killed in war action. Maleva Kerstein, doctor of biochemistry, killed in automobile accident. Both persons have required characteristics and have been incarnated by our envoys. They will contact you. Remember, success of mission depends on exploiting to the full the superstitions prevalent among the Earth creatures. The first objective is Blaustadt Fairground. <laughs> This is the world we have to conquer. Its inhabitants are weak, slaves to their own passions and uncertainties. Couldn't we use atom bombs? Of course. We could even explode their nuclear arsenal. But we need the planet intact. How much time do we have? Very little. Our planet is now nearly at freezing point, and we still haven't discovered how to create an artificial sun. Conditions of life here are similar to those on Umo. We must destroy or dominate the human race, so that our race may colonize this planet. Do you think we'll succeed? We must. These are the remains of the Count Janos Dimailov, the gruesome vampire who terrorized the people in the mystical regions of Transylvania. The only way to destroy him was to plunge a wooden stake into his heart. His magic, hypnotic power died with him. It was inherited only by those like myself, descendants of people who were attacked and contaminated 
by the vampire. For a few coins, I shall hypnotize you and read your future in your unseeing eye. Love, passion, jealousy. Remember what I told you. The passions and weaknesses from which our race is immune are the very ones to which the earth creatures are prey. Love and sex. Have no fear. My beautiful assistant is also a qualified nurse. <laughs> Ask him to tell your fortune. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Promise to tell his tonight. Who will be the first to try? Don't worry. She'll take care of you. Ah, here's the customer. A lady who's not afraid to know the truth. Beautiful women are like powerful magnets. We shall use them to attract scientists, generals, statesmen, with their vital secrets. We've nothing to go on. No fingerprints, no known enemies. Looks like the work of a ghost. Let's start by ruling out ghosts. What about the gelatin substance found on the stake? We sent it and the victim's clothing to the main laboratory. And? Well, in a few days, we'll have some results. There's one detail that intrigues me. The absence of the skeleton exhibited by Fairzar in his show. Remember the legend. The only way to revive a vampire is to withdraw the stake from his heart. As far as I'm concerned, that skeleton is no more than a showman's gimmick. There must be a logical reason for its disappearance. You know, in this part of the country... As you can see, Henry, I'm completely snowed under with paperwork. Why don't you see what you can dig up for me? Right, sir. But don't bring any vampires into this office. Why not? I'm anemic already. Oh. Well, if you're anemic, vampires aren't going to want to attack you anyway. Unless they're, you know, really hard up. Now, as you've noticed, our vampire who formerly terrorized Transylvania isn't called Count Dracula, but rather Count Mihalov. There's going to be a lot of that in this movie, renaming the classic monsters, and I have no idea why. Another thing I'm sure you've noticed is our evil alien from the planet Umo is being played by Michael Rennie, who played the benevolent alien Klaatu in the science fiction classic The Day the Earth Stood Still. <laughs> and after this, we'll be back with my interview with David J. Skull. Vincent Price, and you're invited to my party in the house on Haunted Hill, where so far the ghosts have murdered only seven people. So won't you come and make it eight? You'll see human heads without bodies. Mysterious pools of blood dripping from the ceiling. The walls move slowly in against you. Don't try to escape, you can't. Are you ready to 
know. Are you ready, dear? Yes, damn you. The ghosts are waiting, so won't you join me in the house on Haunted Hill? Hurry, or you'll be late for your own funeral. Drive, huh? it up. Action you've never seen races across your screen as you thrill to a new dimension in picture making Carnival of Souls. This is the shocking story of a who crawl from the river to race through a nightmare, walking a tightrope between heaven and hell. From the unreal, she crashes through to reality. But try as she will to lead a normal life, she is torn from a goal. There's no privacy in her life. She's ever watched, tormented. Either it's her neighbor, desirous of her physically, watching her with his leering eye, or it's the evil eye of the man. The man who taunts her, the man who wants her. From the bottom of the river they come. They reach for her. They demand that she dance with them at the Carnival of Souls. She is a girl driven mad by the relentless forces of the beyond. He will not relent as he comes for her again and again. She whirls between the real and the unreal, trying to cling to life. I like being with you, really I do. I don't want to be alone tonight. I want to be near you. Honey. You don't want to go in there all by yourself, do you? But she must watch herself in death. She must dance at the Carnival of Souls held just for her. For they have come for her for the last time, claiming her as one of their own. Carnival of Souls arouses such emotion that the management has been forced to state positively no refunds. Carnival of Souls is the shocker of all time, guaranteed to sweep you into a new dimension of picture making. You can't afford to miss Carnival of Souls. And now, my lords and ladies, here's my interview with Mr. David J. Skull. My fellow horror geeks, I am thrilled to welcome to the Nerve Rackin' Theater the author of the masterwork on horror, The Monster Show, A Cultural History of Horror, and the creator of the documentary seen on the official Universal releases of their classic monster films, The Frankenstein Files, Bela Lugosi, Hollywood's Dark Prince, and many more. Please welcome to the Nerve Rackin' Theater, Mr. David J. Skull. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and we'll see how racked my nerves are by the end. <laughs> well, I'll try to be gentle. I know this is your first time in the Nerve Racking Theater. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I wanted to interview you specifically for this movie, Assignment Terror, because it's a tribute to the Universal Monster films written by Paul Nashe, Spain's answer to Lon Chaney Jr., and a huge monster fan in his own right. Now, you're well known as an aficionado of the classic Universal monsters. What is it about them that draws you personally to them? Oh, well, I, there, there are the two answers to that. I mean, first, there are the general reasons. Kids, um, it usually happens at a young age. Uh, um, uh, uh, teenagers and preteens uh, gravitate toward, toward the monsters for uh, similar reasons. But then everybody has to pick their own monster and their favorite monster. And that's where it gets more, much more personalized. But, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the monsters embody childhood, you know, anxieties and adolescent uh, 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 struggles. Uh, uh, lots and lots of sex uh, lurking there uh, behind the scenes and um, difficulties with girls. That's certainly um, on the minds of lots of uh, uh, teenage boys. And uh, it really was a boy Kind of activity. There weren't too many girls back uh, back in the day in the '60s. It was a boys' club. It's about raging hormones and 
and uncontrollable hair growth. It's about uh, fumbling attempts to, uh, uh, to, to impress somebody of the opposite sex. I went after Dracula, who really has none of those things. He's, uh, he doesn't, he has instant uh, hypnotic, uh, you know, control of uh, the opposite sex or the same sex or well, whatever, whatever you need. He is in control. Other monsters are out of control. And I think at that moment in the early 60s, when I discovered the monsters, uh, the Cold War was raging. And it was really at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis that I, uh, I discovered the Aurora model kits, I think, first. And uh, all my friends who were into monsters were also male. Uh, I think they were like nuclear security blankets. Um, monsters were things that couldn't die. They usually had that in common. And uh, nobody was giving us, uh, in the real world, nobody, nobody was giving us such reassurance that immortality was possible, but monsters did. You shall call her alone. The first of a group of beautiful women who will blindly obey my orders. Prince of Darkness sleeps soundly. Excellent material for our research. Do you think human beings may become contaminated if his blood is injected into their veins? We'll soon find out. I'm Inspector Toberman. Criminal investigation. In what way can I help? Do you have anything written by Professor Ulrich von Ferenczelam? That's a coincidence. No one has asked for one of his books in years. And you're the second person who's asked in only the last couple of hours. Can you describe the other person to me? It was really a couple. A tall, good-looking man and a very beautiful girl. The man was gray-haired and distinguished, and the girl was strange. She had a very hard look in her eyes. Thanks. Go upstairs. That's where we have the archive section. And then ask for Carl. He'll be glad to help you find it. Thank you very much. Incision penetrating the endocardium, causing damage to the mitral valve. I call that a stab in the heart. I have something else to show you. It's a sample of the gelatin substance found on the victim's clothing. It's composed of living cells, but I can't identify it. We'll have to send it to the main laboratory for a more exhaustive analysis. All right, as quickly as possible. Anthology of the Monsters by Professor Ulrich von Ferenczelam. It's a study of the various legends of man-made monsters. The living mummy, reputed to be somewhere in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Nosferatu, the medieval vampire in the remote regions of Transylvania. The Golem, a giant of clay created in the ghetto of Prague. The missing pages, thanks. Apparently these pages refer to an artificial Thank human you. being created by Faraxelin himself. Listen to the ending. I wish to create a perfect human being, selecting the best organs from different corpses. But God punished me for my presumption, and, and fate caused me to insert the brain of a murderer into the human being which I believed perfect. Today I shall blow up the castle and bury myself with this terrible monster. May God have mercy on my soul. Am I boring you, Eva? Not at all. I find it fascinating. Another nightmare creature, the werewolf. Werewolf? Yes, you see, he was influenced by the full moon. 
In order to release him from this curse, it's necessary to shoot a silver bullet into his heart. Werewolf. Something you remember? I think so. I think when I was a child, my grandmother, or my nurse, I don't know which, told me about the werewolf. He's a man who's transformed into a wolf under the influence of a full moon. are withered, but the body of Valdemar the werewolf is uncorrupted, waiting to receive life. This film has problems from time to time with the sound sync, and it sounds like it's spreading into my segments. If you at home are having problems with the words coming out of your mouth not syncing with your mouth, please seek professional help. that it could happen in America, that it could happen now, that it could ever happen to me. Another murder tonight at Watergate. My apartment. When do you talk a native language? I just started today. Well, what do you say? What do you say? I don't even know what I said. Do I need you, oh, my do I? Maybe. Of course I do. Duke Mitchell and Sammy Petrillo turn an island paradise into the zaniest madhouse in the seven seas. Charlita puts a gleam in Duke Mitchell's eyes. Your smile only added life to your masquerade. Muriel Lamb.
Sanders puts the whammy on Sammy. Sammy! Run for your life! Go on, get out of here, run for your life! Ramona, the romantic chimp, takes off on a romantic chase of her own. Strange. But interesting. Really think so? Mm. What a charming compliment. Bella Lugosi finds the perfect subject to turn a gorilla into a goop and versa visa. What are, you, what are you trying to tell me? I, I don't understand a way. What, what, what am I, dumb or something? Uh, don't, don't answer that. Now look, Duke Mitchell. I'm running this game, you understand? And I'll talk back. Yeah, now put it on, because we got to get out that door. And now, more of my interview with horror expert, David J. Skull. Now, as I said, this film, Assignment Terror, stars and was written by Paul Nashe, who was best known as the werewolf, Voldemar Daninsky. Of course, Lon Chaney Jr. was the original Wolfman in the Universal Classic, damned to an eternal existence, becoming a murderous beast under each full moon. Actually, in the first film, the full moon was not necessary. Just some kind of moonlight. The Wolfman is... Uh... It's, it's, it's a parable about, uh, you know, the beast within coming out. And it's interesting that it is uh, the, the whole, uh, the arc of the Wolfman films. It started right after Pearl Harbor and uh, wrapped up in time for Hiroshima. And it, it, it really, it, it had a lot to do with, with the war. Uh, Kurt Siedmack, who invented the character of, of the Wolfman and wrote the script, was um, a Jewish refugee from uh, uh, from Germany, but uh, the the Wolfman is uh, the wolf comes out of Teutonic uh, mythology. It was one of Hitler's favorite motifs. Uh, he even he loved the Disney film, uh, uh, the Three Little Pigs, and the whistle. You know, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Apparently. He, he just loved it. Um, and that is interesting, because Siob Mac created the entire lore of the werewolf. You know, whereas vampires, as we know them, came mostly from Eastern European lore, what we think of with werewolves transforming under moonlight, becoming a werewolf by being bit by one, etc., that all comes from Kurt Siob Mac and that classic film, The Wolfman. Yeah, yeah, he did it. I, uh, I actually thanked him once for for uh, inventing my childhood. I shook his hand once at a convention, and um, uh, yeah, he gave a tremendous amount to the world. Um, the werewolf in mythology, you know, is very much uh, tangled up with the, uh, with, with the vampire, and in some countries and some traditions, they are essentially the same monster. Uh, in Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula is a werewolf and a vampire. Um, but um, monsters inform each other. You know, they constantly uh, uh, trample on each other's territory. And I describe, uh, you know, the classic icons as um, in, in my book, The Monster Show, as dream carvings on a uh, carousel of the modern imagination. And the faster the carousel turns, the one, the more one monster tends to look like another. The silver bullet in his heart only immobilized him, left him seemingly dead. His death is permanent only if the bullet is fired by a woman who loves him enough to die with him. Ilona. You will give him the injection of the serum which will prevent him from being transformed into a werewolf. You will be fully responsible for him. 
No human power can withstand the contagion of the vampire. Or the mummy, a murderer who obeys only the cabals of Egypt. Or the Frank Sullen monster. We shall make thousands of them and turn them loose on the races of this planet. my shawl back there. I'll get it. customers liked her. There was a full moon last night. I beg your pardon? Nothing. Anything else? There's a man who comes in here every night. They say he's bought the old monastery. Dr. Varnoff. Oh, there he is. Right. Thank you. Scotch and water. Right, sir.
From the depths of hell comes the Devil's Messenger, starring the master of mystery, Lon Chaney, and Karen Cannon. If you my message, you'd have to go back. Up there. Oh, I can't. I won't go back. You deliver that to a Mr. Donald Powell. Don't be afraid of me. The Devil's Messenger delivers gifts from hell, turning man into a ravaging beast. I took a picture of that old farmhouse. There's nobody in the picture. You saw it. Was there anybody in it? No, there wasn't. Somebody has come out of that house, and they're coming toward me. Back from the dead, his lovely victim seeks revenge for her horrible death at the hands of a man-driven man by a gift from hell. Trapped in her icy tomb until the devil's messenger exposed her nakedness in her crystal prison. Now let's get down to here. She becomes the object of a scientist's lust. His consuming desire for her drives him to commit murder, to keep her for himself. Not since he received the apple have gifts inflicted such unnatural consequences. Tonight at midnight, you will be dead. Just how do you intend to kill me? I have no idea. I don't even know you. Crystal ball foreshadows doom. For it is the plaything of the devil. And only he can change the events it foresees. <laughs> you must see what the devil's messenger has in store for you. And now, more of my conversation with David J. Skull. The Mummy, among the classic universal monsters of the 30s, is kind of the odd man out, in that Dracula, Frankenstein, well, I believe in the Invisible Man, had literary roots, having come from famous novels, where The Mummy didn't. Although, you know, many people say that The Mummy was just a remake of Dracula with different characters. Oh, that say that yeah, there is a uh, an antecedent and it is dracula they if it wasn't dracula saved the studio if something isn't broke why fix it so bring back another kind of character who uh uh comes back from the grave uh, you know dead over 500 over 2000 years in the case of the mummy uh but this uh cadaverous uh revenant who comes forth to possess the soul of a young girl and then used the same, used <laughs> the surrounding characters from Dracula, you know, uh, Edward Van Sloan playing a Dr. Van Helsing kind of character, and David Manners um, being the kind of um, ineffectual boyfriend character that he uh, uh, did so well. And, um, and so they didn't uh, take chances. Uh, uh, Todd Browning was like that himself. I've, I've written a lot about him. And he loved to just repeat characters and scenes and motifs and, and uh, 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 costumes and even, you know, set decorations from film to film. It was almost like he was, uh, he was superstitious about it. But again, it was, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Contact made. The tomb of Taotep, the mummy, has now been located. Rocky side of Jebel Karim. Hypogeum of King Amun Ra. The reflection of light in the solid gold mirror transmits orders to the mummy. Come in, Martha. Oh. 
I was expecting a girlfriend. I thought it was her. <laughs> My name is Henry Toberman. I'm from the city police department. I'd like to question you about what happened last night. Come up, please. Excuse me just a moment. Sit down, please. So, you don't remember me, do you? I'm afraid I... You graduated three years ahead of me. Oh, but of course. But you were... I mean, uh... <laughs> I know. Don't be afraid to say it. I was a skinny little girl with freckles, and you were the captain of the football team. Oh, that description doesn't fit you any longer. But to get back to business... About last night. I really don't expect you to believe me. Your colleagues didn't. I have a very open mind about this subject. Is there any further information you can tell me? Anything at all? Not about last night, but my father, Judge Sternberg, had an incredible experience when he was young. Yes? He personally knew a werewolf. Personally knew? I'd like very much to speak to your father.
And if you're not horrified and appalled by what you've just seen in the film, maybe what's coming up next will do it for you, the commercials. An evil reborn from the grave of Frankenstein, bringing a macabre nightmare to a teenage world of rock and roll emotions. For the first time, a female descendant of the infamous Frankenstein, deadlier, more terrifying than ever before. needed her kiss to satisfy his desire, but he wanted her soul for the fiendish creation that was to rule the earth in terror. I'm sure of one thing. You better hurry before the brain cells are damaged completely. Frankenstein's daughter. Now everything was ready. Who would be his first victim? Who will feel the cold sting of death? Kill him. Kill him. Call her off. Don't make me shoot. Go ahead and shoot. She can't even feel it. Kill him! Back! Get back! Kill him! For the most suspenseful and gripping moments you have ever spent, see this masterpiece of Scream a Second Terror. in a love tainted by strange, sinister terror. The siren song of the sea, pulsating like a bongo beat, calling, driving the sea people. You saw how she looked at me, how she spoke to me. She's one of them. She's one of the sea people, and Johnny, I'm so afraid. You're a stranger here, and I guess you don't know what everybody here knows. Ellen, dear. In the past two years, Morris had two boyfriends, and they're both dead now.
David, your book, The Monster Show, really opened my eyes to the relationship between horror and society. What's popular in horror during any specific time reflects the major fears of the time. Can you tell us a bit more about how that book came about? No, yeah, and it, you know, it wasn't a book I uh, set out to write initially. I kind of discovered a lot of the themes as I was doing my, my research. I thought I was just going to do a much more detailed um, making of the Chronicle, you know, of my favorite uh, uh, horror movies. But I went back to the decade where I discovered monsters first. And as soon as I started going through the newspapers and the microfilm and the trade papers, uh, I remembered that monsters didn't scare me. You know, I, I, I kind of reveled in them. Um, but there was something at that time that was scaring the hell out of me. And that was, uh, that was the Cold War and the, uh, the, nu the, the nuclear threat and the, the duck and cover drills and, and uh, you know, the reality of, of, of death, not the, uh, the fantasy of uh, surviving death that uh, these movies were all about. And I just buried that completely. And then when I went through Variety and saw that the number one pop song on the charts during the Cuban Missile Crisis was Monster Mash by Bobby Boris Pickett, a dance of death sung by a mad scientist. I mean, what could be more perfect? And I, I had a very good editor at uh, W.W. W. Norton, and he, he said, well, you really, you know, let's find similar patterns in other de decades. And I went right back to the beginning, and, and uh, lo and behold, I didn't have to look very far. It just kind of... Uh, the story just kind of unfolded, and it was uh, there was a secret history of the 20th century that could be um, discerned through horror movies and horror literature and horror entertainment. As you see, sir, that's merely the official account of the attack on your daughter. But there was a full moon that night, and your daughter told me that you actually knew a werewolf. Yes, that's correct. It was an incredible experience. Something the mind refuses to accept. But it happened. My wife. She died seven years ago. Waldemar Deninsky was in love with the woman who was later to become my wife. Yes, he was a normal man like you, or I. A man of good family. Cultivated, intelligent. Until God knows why, he was afflicted with this horrible curse. He was transformed into a werewolf on the nights of the full moon. It is unthinkable that such horrors should be repeated. Yes, I'll help you all that I can. able to hypnotize you. One danger we must guard against. We are occupying the bodies of Earth people, creatures of a planet much younger than ours. Their feelings and emotions are very strong. They are impulsive and unpredictable. We must be constantly on our guard. We must always maintain our own personalities. Our superior minds must at all times be in complete control. It was just a moment of weakness. In this world, wars have been lost and empires destroyed through moments of weakness. The mummy is our ideal. His heart is dried up. It doesn't feel, doesn't live, doesn't beat. He's a corpse who walks and obeys.
who loves to show it. You suppose he could be physically attracted to her? No, man, he ain't the type. You don't get enough vitamin E. All these are beat. All these you'll meet in a bucket of blood. Let us make the scene. Crazy. Enjoy yourself <laughs> where the hilarious enjoy the horrifying in a bucket of blood. No, you're gonna shoot me, don't shoot! Come to the land of living dreams where realists dream of the unreal. Water, you've done something to me. Something deep down inside of my prana. Oh, Walter, I want to be with you. You're creative. Beatniks at their bawdiest. The creative urge at its most primitive. I'm deeply moved. And I shall compose a poem. Love is art. Art is love. It's the weirdest and the wildest. I don't want to make statues anymore. I, I want to get married. To you. And now, more from our very special guest, David J. Skull. My favorite monster is Frankenstein's monster. Uh, not only because I think he's the most easily relatable monster, especially for adolescents who are, you know, still trying to figure out the world around them, they don't quite fit in, they're awkward, but because that one character represents so much. Uh, the importance of responsibility, parental responsibility, in that Dr. Frankenstein had none, and, you know, see how that turned out. Um, the responsibility of science to society, the human drive to conquer death, just so much meaning in that one character. And the film came out just months after the premiere of Dracula, which is... This was a, this was a risky kind of thing. There, there, the silent era had been full of um, terrifying characters, often played by Lon Chaney, but no supernatural monsters. The, the frightening face was always explained away, you know, as um, um, a criminal conspiracy or a plot to steal an inheritance or, or, uh, or whatnot. And that was the formula, and it kind of came out of the, the drawing room mystery melodrama uh, format that was very popular in the theater. And uh, Dracula was uh, going way out on a limb, and it clicked though, and everybody was was surprised, and so they rushed uh, Frankenstein into uh, production. And it, originally, they had been looking for a new Lon Chaney uh, with quote marks. And uh, at first, they thought Lugosi would be that. In fact, uh, he's billed in certain ads in 1931 says, you know, starring the new Lon Chaney, Bela Lugosi. And uh, they wanted him to star in Frankenstein. Um, first, uh, as Dr. Frankenstein, or he assumed he was going to play Dr. Frankenstein, and then told him he was going to be the monster. And the script is not the same one Karloff did. All, all of the qualities you described uh, were nowhere in evidence. Now, I had read that, that in the early script Lugosi was offered, the monster was just a, a crazed killer. He was a kill machine, and it, it, it was just a... And uh, Lugosi apparently said at the time, he's, he said, uh, I'm an actor, not a scarecrow. I'm not going to do this. And, and they wanted him to put on a ton of makeup and um, uh, didn't want any of it. So he... Uh, exactly how he departed isn't isn't known. He claimed later to have found Karloff for the studio, completely untrue. Whale shaped that final uh, script. It was, it was Whale and Karloff who, who got that, that childlike uh, pathos, and um, uh, that, that's the most affecting thing about it.
Maleva. Maleva. I just got the lab report on the girl who was murdered near the nightclub. Tell us. The strands of hair that we found under her fingernails weren't human. They came from some kind of animal. Yes, well, that about clinches it. We'll head for Blastad immediately. There's something there I've got to check. Ilsa will go with us. I don't want to leave her here alone. She can stay at Superintendent Gluck's. Good. She'll be safe there? She will. test. We shall soon find out if he obeys orders. That was merely a test. The results couldn't have been better. Elona, it will soon be the full moon. Give Valdemar his injection and make it a double dose. Yes. That was a cruel test. Cruel? In our dying world, no one is cruel, nor unjust. We're struggling for survival. We kill or we die. 
There's no other choice. I'm afraid the system of reincarnating the beings of this planet will create problems. Make us susceptible to psychic changes. Well, that's the closest we've gotten to a good old monster fight yet, but, you know, it was hardly fair. Daninsky couldn't even transform into a werewolf because of those injections they're giving him. Let's hope for a rematch soon. Anyway, we'll be back with more movie and more David J. Skull after this. Doomed to produce a race of ever-living monstrosities such as this thing Can a ruthless woman of great wealth buy this living flesh so she may live on like the vampire of legend? <coughs> Deep underground in this chamber of horrors, bodies are for sale. The bodies of young girls. And this is the buyer. Girls are experimented on like animals in this house of horror where the only escape is death. <coughs> Strange legends tell of vampires that crawl from graves. Does the world again face this monstrosity. I'll stay with you with my body and my senses until someone comes and destroys my heart. Barbara Steele in an original and passionate interpretation of the double role of Muriel and Jenny. One woman with two faces or two women with the same face, but profoundly different. A fearful doubt, a sinister enigma, which becomes an obsessive nightmare. <laughs> Victim of the sorcery of a merciless and diabolical sadist. last night. It wasn't just an hallucination. It was something unreal and mysterious. And when I was in bed, I knew I was with you when I heard the heart. A film that will take your breath away, that will hold you spellbound. Ah! Horror, more than any other genre, often deals with religion or religious themes. Dr. Frankenstein challenging God by creating life. Dracula, more so in the novel than in the movie, offering eternal life to his followers. It's a fairly consistent theme in horror film and literature. Yeah, well, I think all the, the monsters, uh, uh, all through the 20th century and even the 19th century, horror stories, um, were a reaction to a world where religion was losing its grip and uh, the clash between science and religion is one of the um, major themes of books like uh, like Bram Stoker's Dracula and uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells and, and um, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, the, uh, the fear of evolution and what it might... Uh, uh, portend the idea that there might be reverse evolution if you weren't careful, uh, that we could uh, evolutionary backsliding could, you know, uh, come and get us all. Horror movies—they've never really been escapist entertainment at the at the core. The prototypes in Germany in the silent era—they were they were art pictures. They were uh, self-conscious parables and, um, and metaphors for uh, the First World War. 
uh, they served a kind of a parallel function to art movements like surrealism and, and Dada, in which uh, the human form and images were, were grotesquely uh, distorted. And uh, horror got its start right in the middle of all, all, all of that. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to stop you. Go. Go on. you mean? Well, as if we'd loved each other previously. It's like something half forgotten. Like a faraway memory. Returning again, isn't it? Perhaps it's the passion, the weakness, Dr. Varnoff warned us about. right over. Now look, Ilsa, why aren't you at Gluck's house? I'm tired of being locked up like a prisoner. What's going on? My father won't tell me anything. Your father has a very good reason. We don't want you staying here alone. I'm not alone now, am I? Oh, I do think I called you. Little mix. 
This is not intended as a punishment, although you might well deserve one. You allowed Alona and Valdemar to escape. We'll never accomplish our mission if you act irrationally, if you let yourself be dominated by emotion. Do you understand why I must do this to you? Yes. I'm a woman with a woman's intuition. You will have to do it for the same reason you killed Kyrian. You were jealous of him. That's why you want me to forget him. You yourself have become contaminated. You also love. Can you forget? out Sternberg's address. He's the district judge. You've decided. If you're caught, you'll be arrested. You know that. I know. I'm cursed. We've no future. No. There's none. There's no future. I can only find peace. A silver bullet is... It's fired by a woman who loves you enough to die with you. He thinks in that strong rock. Mm. There's plenty of Cuban sugar, though. Here's what happened. The general beat his friend Castro to the Cuban treasury. The strong box is now on this boat. So are a deported American gangster and his mall. And lurking in the depths is the creature from the haunted sea. You're a crazy mixed up kid. I am perfectly adjusted to my life of crime. Don't worry, Mary Bell. I'll save you. It's all right. Be calm, everybody. The boat's insured. Please come in. Dr. Varnoff is waiting for you.
We're about to receive a visit from one of your people. One of my people? In a sense. The system of incarnation is not perfect. There's a flaw somewhere. Something of the alien race remains. A certain sensitivity to physical contact. Perhaps an imperceptible reflex to tones of voice. To the expression of the eyes. Something I cannot quite define. Do you think of me as an enemy? No. You're an individual under my domination. Which is quite different from being an enemy. Shall I accelerate the reaction? Yes, do that. Point eight seven. Two cubic centimeters. Uh, good afternoon, Inspector Tobelman. Good afternoon, Dr. Varnoff. I think we've met before. Yes, at the Golden Egg. Uh, forgive me if I don't receive you personally, but as you can see, I'm extremely busy. I suppose you're wondering why I've come here. I know why. And your suspicions are well-founded. But you're still not quite certain. Am I mistaken? No. You seem confused, Inspector Toberman. Perhaps if you looked at the screen behind you, it would clarify matters. Would you believe me if I told you we've come from the planet Umu, some 14 light years distant? It would be presumptuous of us to assume that the Earth is uh, the only inhabited planet in the universe. And what of the legends of monsters, vampires, werewolves, the Frank Southern monster? What's your opinion? Many fantasies are being transformed into reality by modern science. Transplants of heart and kidney, the cornea, perhaps in the near future even the brain. I have no doubt it'll soon be possible to create a Franxalan monster. Our race mastered these techniques centuries ago. That's our mission here, to study the manufacture of monsters who will destroy mankind without exposing ourselves to danger. Supposing this to be true, why are you exposing yourself to me now? Because I know the future, including yours. Are you curious to know what will happen tonight, Inspector Toberman? Hmm. You recognize her? Ilsa. Varnoff, I... Positive factor. And now the most interesting point. Observe. You're not the first individual who has meddled with my plans. These bones are all that remain of the other intruders. Observe the sleeping bats. They will awake, they'll fly around you, and when they sense you're defenseless, they will attack your eyes, till nothing remains but two bloody sockets. Exactly that. We and all the people of this town are extremely concerned. Not one of these recent murder cases has been solved by your department. Furthermore, this Dr. Varnoff. Mr. Mayor, one of my best men, Inspector Toberman, is in charge of these cases, and I'm just expecting a report from him. Gentlemen, I have some information which until now I have concealed for personal reasons. And as you realize, I have more interest in this matter than any of you, since it is my daughter who has disappeared. Judge Sternberg, we're doing everything in our power to find your daughter. Assuming that her absence isn't of her own volition. What is this information? Why haven't you divulged it? Because nobody would believe me. Mr. Mayor, you recall Waldemar Daninsky? Well, he's still alive. I've seen him and talked to him. 
he has something to do with what is happening at the monastery. Mr. Gluck, we haven't time to waste on legal technicalities. All right. We'll pay a visit to that monastery. And anybody who wants to come along will obey my orders. Is that clearly understood? going to wait. Where's Ilsa? I don't know. Maybe in the cellars. Daninsky is transforming, Dracula, I mean Count Milov, is stalking his victims, the Franken what's it monster is stomping about, and the mummy is on the loose. <laughs> we'll be back with some monster brawls and the conclusion of my interview with David J. Skull after this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Universal Studios has tried in recent years to launch, well I should say relaunch, their monster universe, and so far it just hasn't worked. Why do you think they can't just return to the themes and the feel of the original classics? Why can't they get their monsters right, and do you think they will get the monsters right? Uh, I don't know if Universal will get its monsters right. What I do know is that the monsters stay alive through their transformations. You know, I think the idea that uh, you want somebody to do a modernized, just a modern recreation of uh, what was done in 1931 or 1935 or 1939 um, misses the point. Uh, it's even, even a bad adaptation or uh, reimagining of, of one of these characters serves to keep the character alive. And that's where the immortality of monsters comes from. Most of my, my research and writing has been on the subject of Dracula. And I used to be of the mind that, uh, oh, you know, Hollywood has never given Bram Stoker his, his due, and why don't they just do it the way he wrote it? And, and that's not it. These, these monsters are shapeshifters. And if you can just accept that for a minute and, and just roll with it, you might be able to appreciate it. So I really love any attempt to uh, keep these creatures in the, in the public mind. Well, David, as we wrap up here, can you tell us where we can find out more about you and your books and all your works? Oh, well, I'm revamping my, my, my website, uh, monstershow.net. It'll be kind of a clearinghouse for uh, everything. I'm adding a lot of video and, uh, and uh, purchase links to independent bookstores. I'm very active on Facebook uh, under my own name, and uh, you're welcome to come and uh, follow me there. Um, Halloween is always my, my busy time. People ask me, what are you going to be for Halloween this year? And I say, well, I'm going to be the most terrifying monster of them all, a talk show guest. <laughs> well, David, it's been a pleasure and an honor to have you here in the Nerve Rackin' Theater. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much.
Are they going to arrest Dr. Varnoff? No comment. able to control them. Take a position surrounding the monastery. Dr. Varnoff, if you do not leave the monastery immediately, we shall enter by force if necessary. Keep back there. Keep back.
Watch the exit. Keep back there. Two clouds of gas meet. It is pointless to try to escape, Dr. Varnoff. You must pay the price of failure. Have you anything useful to inform us? Yes. We won't be able to destroy them. The passion which we believed was their weakness is what makes them really strong. Stronger perhaps than their nuclear weapons. Can we eliminate these feelings? Possibly. But then would life be worth living? We must survive. We shall try other methods. Anything else? Yes, well, I'm entirely responsible for the failure. Can she be spared? You are forgetting that Dr. Kerstein has ceased to live on Earth. there are men willing to sacrifice themselves for others, nothing will destroy us. Well, we got a couple of good monster brawls in there, including a werewolf fighting a mummy. You don't see that every day. The aliens are defeated, the monsters are dead, temporarily I'm sure, so all that's left to do is to thank our very special guest this evening, Mr. David J. Skull, for being with us. Be sure to check out Monstershow.net to keep up with all of his future works, and if you'd like to see the full, unedited interview with Mr. Skull, go to patreon.com slash lordbloodraw and sign up to see the full interview. Also, to check out episodes of the Cathode Zone and much, much more. <laughs> well, my lords and ladies, I want to thank you all for watching, and I want to invite you all back again next week when we'll do whatever this is all over again. <laughs> As always, I am Lord Bloodraw saying, uh, geek out. <laughs>